Alex here with part 20 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'll direct my viewers to part 0 if you haven't seen it yet. That is the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of this series. Two things that I will glaze over, however, are number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. My excess parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell short version as to the purpose of the series is to create one big gigantic example for my viewers of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. Also, I'm going to give an additional notice every fifth video, and since this is video number 20, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now, that if you are one of the viewers that is upset because you're not getting every update on the series, that is because you have not clicked on the bell notification. That is a little a little button right next to the subscribe button. If you click on that button, YouTube will give you updates on every video that is posted in the channel rather than just updates whenever their algorithm determines that particular update is one that you need to see. So if you're missing some of the published videos, that is why it's happening. We left off in part 19 with my ex's opposition to my motion to have her held in contempt of court. The time between then and the filing of this opposition is negligible. It is just my ex's attorney's filing of an opposition to my motion to modify the temporary order, which was the order setting uh, physical custody such that my ex had primary physical custody and with that came a child support order that would necessarily be modified because the child support um, formula is hinged on the physical custodial designation. So this opposition for the most part, because it was really filed back to back with the other opposition, I don't really have any updates to give my viewers as to my mindset between the two filings. And with that being said, we may as well just go straight into what my ex's attorney has filed. Here we have my ex's opposition to my motion to modify child custody and first thing is that initial paragraph which I've gone over a few times it just mentions who is filing what and what is what it is in reference to in this case it's a it's an opposition to the motion that I filed next section so she does split the uh, points and authorities up into two sections here the first is factual background the second is probably titled it's just titled argument. Argument, legal analysis, it's basically the same thing. So the factual background she mentions when we met at the case management conference, which is a little frustrating for probably both of us because it wasn't recorded so neither this attorney nor I can actually reference what was said at that conference. She mentions agreeing to the change in timeshare, which I've discussed in Part 18 of the My Docket series, it's uh, it's a request that initiated with my ex, so of course she would agree to it. Scrolling down. Okay, so it looks like my ex's attorney also got a copy of that interim order that was wrong. It wasn't just me. This is interesting, I didn't know this. So that interim order, uh, the judge marked down the wrong boxes for who was supposed to have primary physical custody. And based on this remark here by my ex's attorney, it appears that I wasn't the only one that got the, the incorrect paperwork. So the paperwork on file is actually correct and it shows where the judge scratched out the marks that he made incorrectly. He puts little initials, he scratches it out. And it looks like neither myself nor my ex's attorney was aware that the judge fixed this prior to actually filing it. My ex is alleging that I failed to pay child support in January. This doesn't sound right. And since I don't remember what she's talking about, it must have become a non-issue at some point. 
When this comes up again on my reply, I'll probably be, probably be able to give my viewers more details as to what my ex is talking about, but I don't want to look into the future, and so at this point in time, she's saying that I failed to pay child support for January, but I'm not sure um, if that's correct, and if so, it wasn't a big deal because at, at this point in time, I don't remember being called out for it or punished for it in any way, so I'm assuming that my reply to this opposition will adequately you know, explain what's going on here. Or maybe it's just that I just flat out deny that. I'm supposed to pay half of the healthcare premiums. Saying So she's saying that I didn't make payment to this either. I can't recall this in detail either. So again, let's hang in there and wait for my reply to this opposition. I'll probably have a better answer for my viewers on that too. But anytime I can't recall details like this, it's a big, uh, it's a big flag that whatever it was in connection to this allegation never went anywhere. I don't know what the point is of that last paragraph. She's just saying that Okay, so my ex's allegation was that the only reason I wanted custody of my son was to reduce child support. And then she lets the court know that I said I was happy to pay child support. Okay, so that's not that's not a law saying that I was happy to pay it. And I, I highly doubt that I said I was happy to pay it. Next section is the argument. So this is where we're going to see some, some authority and some citation to law, or at least that's what we're supposed to see here. She agrees to the time, to the change, uh, change of uh, timeshare. And of course, this is because she had a problem with her work schedule. So if she didn't agree to this, she'd be pretty screwed because she wouldn't be able to get to work on time. So this was an, a request that originated with her, and I brought it up in my motion. I should probably bring this up to my viewers. Try not to do this. If your ex is asking for something, they need to file the motion because it gets really weird when you file the motion for them and ask for what they want. You're not supposed to do that in your motion. And then what it causes is them on opposition to have to say, yeah, we're okay with that because that's what we wanted anyway. Sometimes they'll still oppose it and make you look like a goofball. You'll be like, well, Your Honor, they said they wanted that in an email, so I asked for it. If you don't, if it's something that you don't want, that your ex wants, they need to ask for it in their paperwork. Don't ask for it in yours. And this is a mistake that's actually quite common. I've seen people do this before. She's saying she should retain primary custody. These are just, it looks like she just kind of copied and pasted a bunch of statutes to fatten up this, uh, this filing. I've seen a lot of attorneys do this where they'll just take the entire legal section and just paste the whole thing in there. Um, it, it's better to cite specifically what it is you need and not just take entire sections of, of the law that have all kinds of additional authority that doesn't apply to what you're requesting. But it looks like um, this is definitely common. I've seen lots of, lots of attorneys do this. They'll take just entire swaths of uh, statutes and paste it into their motions. I'm not sure why they do it, but um, one of the side effects of it, whether intended or not, is to make the paperwork look a lot fatter than it would have been, a lot more substantial. Rivero 2008 is cited. And this is apparently a piece taken from Missouri, a Missouri case. Nothing really surprising here. Okay, so I remember this argument. This is the argument that my ex's attorney makes where she says that just because I have the child a substantial amount of time doesn't mean I should have primary physical custody or joint physical custody of that child. She's saying that the time is not enough she is saying that the court must consider more than just the time. Now, I do recall the judge confronting my ex's attorney about this. He looked her right in the eye and he said, you, you know what, the time is everything. And she was like, no, Your Honor, it's all it's about this, this, and this too, and they need to be able to cooperate. And he's like, no, they don't. If he has the child this percentage amount of time, he gets uh, physical custody of the child. And I remember winning on that um, that issue, but it takes quite a while for the judge to really address it. He, he kind of dodges it for several hearings, and I think he just kind of hopes we're going to go away. And finally, at the very end of the row, he, he has to confront my ex-attorney and tell her she's wrong. And there's also another case called Mosley v. Big Liuzzi, which explains that if a joint physical custody situation cannot work because the conflict between the parties is too high and they won't cooperate, you do not just give primary physical custody to the one that is pointing the finger at the other as being not cooperative. According to Mosley v. Big Liuzzi, the court actually has to do some investigation and find out who the high conflict parent is, pinpoint that parent, and deprive 
that parent of custody. So what they're recognizing in Masli v. Figliuzzi is that the person pointing the finger at the other parent as not being able to cooperate could in fact actually be the non-cooperative parent who should be deprived of physical custody of the child. So this argument that this attorney is making is um, it's just flat, it's flat wrong. She's saying that I had to lay out, she's saying that she had to lay out diapers and a food tracking schedule, which isn't true. This is weird. She's saying that I purchased a car seat only recently. There's no way that I was driving him around without a car seat. So I purchased a car seat when I was driving him. I mean, that that's just a given. She says that the clothes were soaked with urine. That was not true. I remember this uh, allegation very, very vividly because it, it alarmed me because it, I dropped him off and he was just fine. And then I got this email from her right away saying that his clothes were soaked with urine. And that's the, that's one of the times when it was underlying to me that what she was going to do was fabricate evidence or incidents that never existed to bolster her claim for uh, primary physical custody. She's saying a judge's job is more than just manipulating a mathematical formula. Sometimes, not always, sometimes a judge's job is manipulating a mathematical formula. It's all about the statutes. The, ju the judge's job is defined by the legislature. If the, ju if the legislature gives the judge discretion, the judge has discretion. If the, judges if the legislature gives the judge a formula, the judge has no discretion, and his job is, quite frankly, to apply the formula. Otherwise, his decision will be reversed on appeal. A judge's job, she makes it seem like it's more than what it actually is. And this is just because it's convenient to her. If you would flip the situation around, you know, put the shoe on the other foot, she would be arguing the exact opposite. She'd be saying that the judge doesn't have any of this authority and the mathematical formula controls the custody that her client should get. I talk about this in the video, Win at All Costs Lawyering. They will argue one thing for one client and then argue something completely the opposite for another. Um, they'll contradict themselves all the time because it's not about having a consistent position. It's about winning their cases. And sometimes they'll need to say one thing for one client to win that case and then the complete opposite thing for another client to win that case. So you can't take this stuff personally. This is just how they do their jobs. In this next section, she's trying to include more of my income, something called the entertainment bonus. I talked about this in previous videos. This is the, uh, com it's basically commission that Circuit City reopened. Like they had commission when they first um, were established as a company and then they dropped commission when they wanted to compete with Best Buy. Then towards the end of their existence, they brought commission back, but they called it entertainment bonus instead. Probably doesn't sound as bad. I guess commission back then was considered a pretty negative word. Um, anyway, she's just trying to get the judge to include my entertainment bonus. I can't recall exactly what happened with this. I think she did get this for a short while, but the issue ended up resolving itself very quickly because I ended up modifying the order for child support um, not too long after anyway. So this isn't a, a, a point of much contention to me. Curiously, she didn't bring up the, the cases indicating that temporary orders really, I mean, I wasn't really entitled to a modification on the temporary order anyway. She could have brought up another case saying that um, that the court's order was temporary and that the court could just summarily uh, deny my request and, and just tell me, you know what, you just need to wait till trial. And um, she didn't bring that up, so that's, that's a little interesting. Um, it's also possible that, that she really didn't want to push for trial, and so she probably didn't want to bring something like that up, only to have me call her out on it. Here's her affidavit. We talked about this in the previous video. This is required by the court rules, and this affidavit makes sure that the lawyer's client swears under penalty of perjury that every factual allegation made in the opposition is true. Uh, here we got the affirmation. Talked about this again multiple times. It just lets the clerk know that this particular document does not have a social security number in it. Scrolling further down, certificate of mailing, and this is what I've talked about on several occasions prior. You can just include a service, a proof of service inside of a, fi uh, a filing, and you do so by adding a certificate of mailing or a certificate of service, whatever you want to call it, at the uh, as one of the the last uh, pages in that document. And that way, you can avoid filing a whole separate document indicating that you served it. You can just have it all done. Um, just in this one filing. It's it's a lot cleaner and this is something that I would start to do you know, as soon as I learned how you know to prepare my um, custom papers uh, more competently I, I would begin to do this myself just because I myself liked 
less paperwork, less paperwork, less filings, less things to look at. It's it's just good all around. The court loves it too. Next section is the family court motion opposition notice. I talked about this on several occasions. You check a bunch of boxes, follow the instructions, and you will determine at the very end whether or not you have to pay a $25 filing fee. In this case, my ex did not have to pay it. Index of exhibits. This is required if you're going to include exhibits in the second judicial district court. If you do not include this index, you will be turned away. Make sure that you look at your uh, local rules to determine whether or not an index of exhibits is required. Sometimes I would call it the list of exhibits. In fact, probably most of the time. Exhibit one, this is a separate, uh, I guess, what do you want to call it? A, a separation page, a page that um, clearly distinguishes that what follows is not a part of the paper, it is one of the exhibits to the paper. This is an email from myself to my ex indicating okay, indicating that I am paying rent and Okay, so it looks like I moved, so I need to pay the, the last bit of rent for the studio that I was living in and for the new place at the same time. And I, oh, here, so, okay, so this answers my question. So I told her right here I needed to pay two rents simultaneously and that she was going to get the $200 on my first paycheck. So I imagine that, let's take a really quick look at when this was filed. She filed this on January 8th. And this email came to her on December 28th. So perhaps uh, she just took advantage of the fact that I hadn't paid that yet because I hadn't got my first paycheck yet. So she was just letting the court know, hey, I didn't pay child support. Well, that's nice. I mean, I'm going to pay it as soon as I can. I just have to pay two, uh, two rent checks. I'm assuming that this was paid by the time it got to a hearing or something like that because um, it just it was never an issue. And then here's, okay, so same thing with the insurance payments. By March, everything should be steady and caught up without interruption. So this addresses both of her allegations. I don't know why she attaches it. It's like she's letting the court know that I'm in good faith communicating to her that I'm going to make these payments and using that as evidence that I haven't made the payments yet. You know, any normal family judge is going to say, he says he's going to make the payments. Let me know if he doesn't. So um, this, this ended up being a non-issue because I can't remember it coming up at all. Uh, these are a little tricky. It looks like these are just the previous communications. This one, this one's from my ex. She's giving me the details on the insurance info. She's giving me the math on what I would need to pay. She's giving me his sleep schedule, including a nap schedule. She says he won't sleep if I have these devices going. She's saying when she puts him to sleep, nothing is really jumping out at me. It's just routine. She's she's basically trying to control my routine, almost like I'm another babysitter. So so there, these are like a list of instructions that have to be followed. She's asking me to put the dirty clothes in a plastic bag for her. I do recall doing this toward in the beginning, but this um, ultimately becomes a non-issue because the judge orders clothing to no longer be exchanged. <laughs> no verbal contact unless it's an emergency. That is something that she didn't have to say because that's what I wanted to. If these expectations aren't met, I will be documenting it every time. This is an ominous statement at the end from a person who has their parental rights terminated. But this is how they are. A lot of people think um, that abusive and neglectful parents are, you know, just like lackadaisy. They don't really communicate. They just don't care. That's not true. There's a lot of abusive and neglectful parents that send all kinds of communi uh, communications to their other partner that insinuate that they are a protective parent and that they love the child and in fact sometimes they go a step further and insinuate that the other person is abusive or neglectful and this is just a um, uh, what I call narcissistic pretexting I have a separate video on it there's gonna be more of this to show here's exhibit two and I think this one is a little bit worse if I remember correctly yep it is <laughs> she's saying his clothing is soaked with pee yeah this is what I was talking about in the uh, actual paper she filed this isn't true so this is her, her attempt to fabricate evidence. She's saying that the lawyer's going to file abuse charges against me, which never, never happens. In fact, it's the exact opposite. 
This last section here, I just can't remember any details on. She's complaining about my refusal to place him into her car seat inside of her car. But I can't remember this being a problem or this being even a request from her. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Because she was claiming I was dangerous, she didn't want me anywhere near her car. So maybe this was true, though, because this is back in early 2009. It's possible. I think, hopefully, I address it on my reply because I just can't remember anything like this in my case. As I've said previously, the only thing I remember was towards the end where she made a big deal out of taking him out of my car, waking him up, and putting him on the ground so that he could walk to her and that she could place him into her car. So this is just very different, a very different story, but it's it's plausible. It honestly is because this these logistics were constantly, constantly scrutinized. When I talk to people about how each exchange is a nightmare, it's stuff like this. It's just... Um, the goalposts are always moving. What she expects or what she wants was always changing. The, it's one of those things where you could do no right. So I think I probably addressed this on reply, but at the same time, I don't recall her bringing this last paragraph up in her opposition. So it's entirely possible that in my reply, I didn't address it because it wasn't in her opposition. So we will see when I get to that video. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Going into the aftermath, I myself incurred no cost because I didn't file this document. My ex also incurred no costs based on that motion opposition notice. She didn't have to pay a filing fee. The document was just mailed to my house, so that would have cost her a stamp, which is a negligible amount. I'm just going to ignore that. The attorney fees. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex was probably charged two hours for this document. It isn't very detailed, it isn't very long, and it's likely that the attorney spent 15 to 30 minutes of that time just communicating with my ex and reviewing the emails that she submitted to her. I, I doubt that she just submitted these two emails. She probably submitted a plethora, and the attorney sifted through them and picked a couple out that she thought would make her case look stronger. So two hours, it's probably a bit on the light side, but I'm going to continue to stay on the conservative end of that. I'm not going to try to inflate these numbers, and that is going to put her attorney fees at $500. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to post them down into the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.